This airline mismanaged itself so badly that they only lasted a year. Now, it's kind of hard to process that because in the terms of airlines, you'd think going into it, one might have a fair bit of understanding of how difficult it can be to run such a business. And yet, the individuals responsible for what I'm going to call Braniff 3, more on that later, so he did not quite get how airlines operate or how to run one. And yes, they closed down in just a year. Also, two of them went to prison. Oh yeah, this is gonna get good. Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Real Critics, and of course my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains crashing, just just obliterating into the into the earth. Just just gone. It's terrible. And today we are gonna discuss the tale of Braniff International Airlines Incorporated, which is generally referred to as Braniff 3 because of reasons I'll explain. They began operations on July 1st, 1991, and they ceased operations on July 2nd, 1992. It's embarrassing. Now before we move forward, let's discuss the jumbo jet in the room here. Braniff 3. Why 3? Well, that's because there have been at least two different airlines prior to this one that also ran under the name Braniff. The original, Braniff Airways Incorporated, was founded on May 29th, 1928. Eventually, they would change their name to Braniff International Airways in 1948, and then again to just Braniff International in 1965. They ceased operations on May 12th, 1982, although, technically speaking, Braniff isn't gone. Only airline operations ceased at that time. Their subsidiaries actually continued. That part of the company is still operating as of now. But in terms of airlines, there was another. Braniff Incorporated, or Braniff 2, commenced operations on May 1st, 1984, and was partially formed from assets of the original Braniff. But they didn't last very long either. They ceased operations November 6, 1989. Which brings us to Braniff International Airlines Incorporated, or for the sake of clarity, Braniff 3. In 1990, Jeffrey Chotterell, Arthur Cohen, and Scott Spencer formed BN Air Incorporated, used for the very, very precise purpose of purchasing the assets of Braniff Incorporated, the second Braniff from three different bankruptcy auctions. They won those auctions, and with those assets, wound up forming Braniff International Airlines Incorporated, Braniff 3. Now, Chotterell had already been involved with Braniff prior to this. In June 1988, his other company, Beacor Holdings, had actually purchased Braniff 2. But when it went bankrupt, he got new partners and repurchased the assets through the bankruptcy auction. It was some weird corporate finagling is what it was. But basically, he wanted to get a hold of the airline again so he could actually run it correctly this time. But even early on, the U.S. Department of Transportation had zero faith in Braniff 3. Like, at all. They were worried about their management team specifically. At the time, they were headed by Scott Spencer and he was supposed to be the president and chief executive officer. But the problem with Spencer is mostly due to the fact that he had a questionable history when it came to conduct and, uh, well, being a criminal. See, he had worked as a consultant with Braniff too, but during that time, he was repeatedly arrested for writing bad checks, and there had been a warrant for his arrest for failure to return a rental car back in 1988. The US DOT did not give them an air operator certificate, and from the get-go, they were already trying to be sketchy to get around that. They attempted to acquire the assets of another bankrupt company, Emerald Air, and that would give them their air operator certificate, but the US DOT was not having that. They refused to certify Braniff unless they were given sworn affidavits stating that Spencer was not gonna be involved in any capacity. They did not want this man anywhere near an airline. 
Jotaro was forced to give in, but that did satisfy the US DOT, and they were cleared to begin flights on July 1st, 1991. Just the previous month, on June 15th, they had announced that a man named Sheldon Shrulevich was appointed president of their new airline, and that was actually good news. He was a 35-year airline industry veteran, and he had worked with the original brand of Airways back in 1970, before he retired in 1980. But he only lasted in that role for about half a month. Like, literally the day they began flights. On July 1st, they announced that one Mr. Gregory B. Dix, who was a travel industry CEO and a race car driver, would instead assume the role as presidency and that Trulovich had left the company. It wasn't a good look early on, but things seemed fine as far as customers were concerned. When they first started flying, their fleet consisted of eight leased aircraft, five Boeing 727s and three McDonnell Douglas DC-9s. That's a fairly small fleet, but it was good enough to get them started, certainly. And the whole plan, the idea behind Brand of Three was to be a budget airline. They wanted to get as many customers as possible by charging, well, less than their competitors. Obviously, you get what you pay for here, and the flights wouldn't exactly be extravagant, but they would get you to where you wanted to go. However, on the 16th of July, 1991, Braniff all of a sudden ended their service to Los Angeles International Airport, claiming that they were not given access to a gate or a ticket counter. Gregory Dix attributed those problems to a lack of cooperation by LAX officials, but that was swiftly denied by the Los Angeles Director of Airport Operations, so it's kind of unclear. And, and then, and then, on the 7th of August, 1991, Braniff filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. What? You've only been operating for 37 days. How did you... How did you fail that quickly? Well, they cited their loss of a Canadian charter contract, which was unnamed, so it wasn't even clear if that was true or not, as well as the suspension of LAX service, which did happen, but it was really sketchy as to why it had happened. Though even though they were in bankruptcy, they did continue operations, though they wound up suspending the Dallas-Fort Worth to Fort Lauderdale route. They also ceased operating charters with their 727s, though they kept doing it with the DC-9s. Dix would comment about the reorganization, explaining that we've continued to consolidate our operations within the New York, Long Island, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Florida Triangle, maintaining our commitment to serving tourist markets and building our niche as a leisure carrier. And they did actually kind of do that. Like I said, their whole thing was cheap rates, and the vast majority of their tickets cost less than $100. Even in the early 90s, that was a pretty good price for airfare. But on the corporate level, things continued to unravel. On September 12th, 1991, they completely ceased operations at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, which is interesting, because that was where they were based at. They cited a dispute with an aircraft lesser. But at that point, apparently Dix got fed up with whatever the heck was going on in the corporate structure and left the company. Chotaro assumed the presidency, which is hysterical because he really didn't have any experience doing anything like this at all. He was hardly in a position to helm a company that was already in bankruptcy. But, uh, well, that's what he was going to do. But from the outside looking in, things did start to improve by December. Chotaro would announce the airline had arranged for financing to again return to its DFW base, and they would resume service, while at the same time announcing a pretty busy schedule to begin in January 1992. They began hiring a ton of personnel for all positions, and on January 1st, 1992, they reported a profit of $28,000 for the month of December 1991. Not a massive amount for an airline, but it was a profit, and that's good. And by January 15th, they began operations to several different major cities throughout the United States, including Atlanta, Boston, Chicago Midway, Columbus, Miami, New York, Orlando, Tampa, West Palm Beach. Most of the big ticket cities were covered by them. But in case you're thinking that things might start to get better, I don't know if you've been paying attention. Let me just show you this. This is very important to me. The route planning at Braniff was often sketched out on a drawing pad. Seriously, just pretend the United States is in the background and this is what they were doing. They, they were literally just drawing lines on paper being like, yeah, the planes go, go here, uh, but then, the, then they should go over here too. And, and then down here, 
yeah, I, 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 that looks good. That looks good. That's, that's, this just, I mean, see, I, I understand making the sketch, like, in a boardroom meeting, maybe, just to get a visual detail on the fly, but apparently this was a very normal way of doing it. But further profits were reported for the month of January, $128,000 this time, which was much better. But at the same time, the DOT reported that 25 complaints were received concerning brand of service for the month of January. They did this on February 1st. There were 10 reports of cancellations or delays, which given how small Braniff was, that's a... That's a lot. Like if American Airlines gets 10 reports of delays for a month, given how large they are, that's actually very good for them. But Braniff, remember, had less than 10 planes. So how did you have that many cancellations in the span of a month when you don't even have that many aircraft? And yes, I know, the planes are obviously flying more than one time, because duh, but still the point is for their size, that was very high. So the DOT was getting a bit skeptical. But behind the scenes, Braniff, being a budget line, had tried to cut costs in a lot of other areas. And that included what they deemed to be unnecessary employees. There are things that airlines need in order to operate. Maintenance people, for one. A and they did have those. There were no accidents attributed to them, thank goodness. But, for example, before the internet was in common usage, the way you would get reservations of flights generally was by phone. You would call. And therefore, every airline worth their salt would have a call center, often more than one, to help field the inquiries of people wanting to fly on their planes. And yeah, that makes sense. It seems like that's a worthwhile investment to have that because the more reservations you have, the more money you make because that's more ticket sales. Duh. Well, Braniff decided that it wasn't necessary to really staff their call center with that many people, or even have that many lines in general. Their reservation center was overwhelmed in mid-February, and they did install a few new phone lines to handle it, but that was still only enough to handle 500,000 calls per month. And given the fact they received 3 million, you see how this was a problem. Despite this, on March 1st, they again reported a profit of $197,000 for the month of February, and they had managed to push their fares down per seat mile to just 0.6 cents, compared to TWA's 8.2 cents and 9 cents or more for the other major carriers. Brannish seemed to be doing the whole budget thing all right, but they did also receive 18 complaints for the month of February, but that was technically down compared to January, which, remember, had received 25 complaints. And on March 20th began their inauguration of service at Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Columbus, and Minneapolis, St. Paul. And on April 1st, which... <laughs> yeah, some jokes just write themselves. They adopt the advertising slogan, You can't beat the rate, which of course refers to their low fares. In fact, they offered a fare of $198 round trip between Newark and Miami or Orlando without any restrictions, though only select seats were sold at that pricing level. But by the end of April, branded passengers were being met with very long lines at ticket counters because, well... Again, Braniff was not investing in other areas of their operations. Like, yeah, they had cheap rates and their planes weren't crashing, but there's a lot of other factors when it comes to managing the amount of people that might want to, say, use your airline. The call center was bad enough, but then there were the agents. Braniff's ticket agents were still writing tickets by hand. They weren't doing it electronically. You know, the way that every airline does it these days, and the vast majority of them did back then, too. Writing by hand was long since obsolete, and they claimed they were waiting for new electronic ticketing machines from a French company, but hadn't received them yet. And the reason they were so busy was simply due to the cheapness of it. They did have low fares, that was a fact, and it was attracting customers, but they were completely unequipped to actually manage the customers. They couldn't schedule reservations effectively, and even if people did get that far, they were left waiting forever to actually receive their boarding passes because they were writing them out with a pen and paper, like crazy people. It gets to a point where even people who want to save money are willing to spend more just for the convenience of actually scheduling their flight and getting to the gate unimpeded by nonsense. And that was Branagh's biggest problem. 
you know, outside of the fact that the management had no idea what the heck they were doing. Because by July 2nd, 1992, just a day after their one year anniversary of starting flights, they cited intense competition and fare wars and once again filed bankruptcy, but this time completely ceased operations, filing for Chapter 7 bankruptcy liquidation proceedings. In their defense, the early 90s had been rough for airlines. They were the fourth one in 18 months to seek bankruptcy protection, along with Pan American World Airways, Midway Airlines, and Eastern Airlines. The brand had really stood out because they were only a year old, and what the heck were they doing? It seemed like they were busy. People were flying on them. Why couldn't they stay afloat? Well, this is where things start to get really sketchy for the company. On July 7th, Braniff encouraged their passengers with confirmed tickets that were purchased with credit cards to contact their credit card companies for refunds, not them. Which, wait, no, that's, you're supposed to, hmm. They also announced that they are considering refunding tickets that were paid for with cash or checks. I'm sorry, considering? No, 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 no. You, you have to give that back. You didn't do the service that they paid you for. That's no. No, 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 no. On July 8th, Aeron Aviation President Amos Giran, who was the owner of eight Boeing 727s that Braniff operated, repossessed the aircraft after the federal bankruptcy judge overseeing Braniff's case approved the repossession of five of the eight jets, and they were in the middle of filing to repossess the remaining three. It came out that Aaron had not received the $800,000 in lease payments owed by Braniff. They weren't paying them for the planes, and by the time Braniff had ceased operations, they were only operating 13 aircraft, 10 727s, and the three DC-9s. By July 13th, Chonaro explained that he had had inquiries from 10 potential bidders wanting to purchase their operating certificate to put the airline back in the air. That, 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 that wouldn't happen, just, just so we're clear. And by August 12th, the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District had appointed a trustee for Braniff. The trustee was Mr. Abraham D. Sofar. And the whole reason they had really shut down was that their methodology in terms of their customers getting flights was a complete pain in the butt. Buying tickets on them required calling the airline or visiting a ticket counter as the carrier was not part of a large airline reservation system. Because of that, tickets couldn't actually be purchased at travel agencies, which back in the early 90s people used a lot. But it also seemed like their low fare system didn't really help them at all. Yeah, they were getting a lot of people on the planes, and that's great, but so were other carriers, and for more money. The simple fact is, a company needs to make money in order to stay afloat. And in order to stay afloat, they need to spend that money by investing it into themselves. They need to pay their leasing fees, for one thing. And they need to pay for enough staff to actually manage their customers. If you do not do this, you lose customers, and therefore you stop making what money you are. And if you aren't charging enough for a product, you can no longer produce that product. And being a budget airline isn't necessarily a bad idea, but you have to be able to balance the books here and do basic math to figure out exactly how much you have to spend in order to stay afloat. Braniff didn't do this. And remember how I started this talking about the Spencer thing? How the US Department of Transportation was promised he would absolutely in no way be involved in this company whatsoever? Yeah, well, see, in early 1992, both the FAA as well as US DOT were informed that Spencer was secretly being paid by Braniff. Now, why would they be doing that if he wasn't contributing? Hmm. Oh, and that the airline's corporate officers were engaging in a money laundering scheme. Oh yes, this goes far beyond just mismanagement. That was bad enough, but there was more to it than that in Braniff's case. The scheme was designed to conceal the fact that Spencer was even involved at all from the airline's creditors and the bankruptcy court and the USDOT which, remember, had received sworn affidavits stating that Spencer would not at all be involved in this company. He was. 
Chotaro would wind up submitting another affidavit, where he claimed that the pledges made in the May 1991 affidavits had not been violated. <laughs> You're gonna double down on that lie then, are you? Okay, the investigation quite quickly determined that Spencer had actually been heavily involved in the operations of the airline, and had been paid $351,411 in secret kickbacks from commissions paid to an advertising agency, whose owner was then granted immunity in return for his testimony against Spencer. A little over two years after they ceased operations, July 19th, 1994, Jeffrey Chotaro and Scott Spencer were indicted for bankruptcy fraud. They were accused of concealing the bankrupt airline's property from creditors, as well as defrauding the U.S. DOT during the airline certification and obstructing a pending proceeding of the agency. Chotaro would wind up agreeing to a plea bargain, the U.S. government dropped the bankruptcy fraud charges against him in return for a guilty plea for defrauding the U.S. DOT. He would be sentenced to four months in prison and four years supervised release. He was also ordered to pay a $40,000 fine, and he was also ordered to pay the airline's bankruptcy trustees one and a quarter million dollars in restitution over five years. Spencer would wind up admitting that he had acted openly and flagrantly on behalf of Braniff in violation of the terms of the 1991 affidavits, which again said that he wasn't going to be involved at all. He was convicted of bankruptcy fraud as well as conspiracy to commit bankruptcy fraud and was sentenced on the 23rd of May 1996 to a 51-month prison term, followed by three years of supervised release. He also agreed to pay $115,000 in restitution to the bankruptcy trustees. So I guess at the end of the day, what you can say about Brand of Three is that it was a total mess, a disaster, a complete screw-up on almost all fronts. And as for the aftermath of those involved, well, prior to trying to run an airline, Chotaro had a history with running restaurants, a successful one, which, not at all the same industry whatsoever, but after he paid his debt to society, he went back to that, and he was involved with the program The Restaurant, which was a reality show that aired on NBC in 2003. It got a second season in 2004, though the show was eventually cancelled, and Chotaro would eventually sue the celebrity chef that was on the show, Rocco Disparito, and win. He actually owned several restaurants, and most of his dealings seemed to involve feuding with food critics. Spencer, on the other hand, oh my goodness, this man is out of control, it's hilarious. Somehow, and I still don't know how, he managed to weasel his way back into the airline industry and again get arrested and go to jail over it. This is another story in and of itself, but I'll give you the cliff notes. In 2007, the San Bernardino International Airport Authority awarded Spencer, did they not run a background check? I'm just saying, two lease agreements to develop a passenger terminal for commercial airlines and a fixed base operation for private pilots. During the course of this project, Spencer would wind up stealing $175 million in public funds, and in exchange for pleading guilty to tax evasion, all other charges were dismissed. The DOT has had enough of Spencer, and they actually ordered him banned from the aviation industry in 2005. But that was because he was also apparently operating an unlicensed charter flight company on the side. The man cannot stop breaking the law, apparently. It's, it's just nuts. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson, 131-232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Raw Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Lord Hot 444, That Guy with a Beard, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Rohat to 2860, Icerfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Ohio Drugger 1, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Alderick Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, and his Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, Dr. Racer 78, and The Baxter. Till next time, 
This is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.